I'm a cloud solution architect at Eucalyptus Systems. Um, I spend most of my time with customers building clouds, so the private clouds, on-premise. Um, most of my time is spent in Europe and on uh, East Coast US, so with customers in those regions. Um, and then I spend a bit of time in the cloud automation space as well, uh, working specifically on Ansible um, and improving kind of Ansible AWS and Eucalyptus module, uh, modules there. Um, before I go on and just give a little bit of background in Eucalyptus, who's, who's heard of Eucalyptus before? Okay, so loads of people have. Who's actually used Eucalyptus? Okay, so we've got two. Okay, so it's either like really good or really, really bad. <laughs> so uh, who uses AWS? Yeah, who uses AWS in like a production kind of capacity, so to actually do serious work? Cool, cool, cool. Okay, so, so Eucalyptus, um, and, and you know, since most of you have heard of Eucalyptus, um, private cloud software, um, it was started as a university project in 2007. Uh, this is probably like two years after sort of AWS came onto the scene, I think. Um, and it was led by um, a research team at the University of Cal California, Santa Barbara, um, led by a, a professor there, Rich Wolski, who later went on to become our CTO. Um, not many people know this, but Eucalyptus is actually an acronym for Elastic Utility Computing Architecture for Linking Your Programs to Useful Systems. So it's, it, it, it's, it really rolls off the tongue, uh, and I'm sure you will all come away remembering that. But um, <laughs> um, Eucalyptus, uh, yeah, the, the, the company that I work for now was founded in 2009. Uh, in 2010, uh, we brought in Martin. Sorry, yeah, go for it. Bit louder. Okay. Okay, a bit louder. Um, in 2010, um, Martin Mikos from MySQL fame joined, uh, joined us, um, joined us to, uh, uh, to, uh, as our CEO. Uh, right now, we're about uh, 65 um, employees in the company, uh, spread across worldwide. Uh, we've got um, me here in Europe, uh, covering sort of EMEA region. Um, we've got a fairly sizable chunk of folks in the US, uh, and then we've got teams in India and China as well. And our main focus, uh, since I've mentioned it already, and you've probably heard about all the different press and all this API war stuff that's talked about and all this, um, that our main focus with Eucalyptus is on AWS compatibility. And this is probably like my only marketing slide, um, but that is pretty much our current tagline, which is uh, your own availability zone. So the idea is that Eucalyptus can Complement those who are currently using AWS, uh, ha have got all the tool chains built up, all of that investment in AWS, um, and you can run an on-premise kind of uh, uh, version of that, um, retain the same kind of tools, same expertise, all that kind of stuff, um, and you get your own, your own availability zone effectively, or, or multiple availability zones, as I'll, I'll go into a little bit later. So, and, and, and that little bit of text in the middle is pretty much what, we're, what we believe. Um, we believe that, that, that AWS is the most widely used public cloud, and I think that's, not sort of the, that, that's a fact. Um, we, uh, uh, we think that the AWS API and the constructs and the semantics in that are um, the de facto standard right now. Um, and so we're going to a place where we're really um, chasing the kind of developers. So where, where are the developers who are working in public cloud right now? A lot of them are in AWS, so that's where we're going to focus our efforts right now. Um, and, and I think that's, that, that's uh, and, and the large ecosystem part is really um, a bonus of that. Yeah, got a question, go for it. No. Hey, hey good question though. <laughs> I've, I, yeah, I've, I've, never heard, I've never heard anyone ask that one, but, uh, but, but yeah. That's a new one. That's a, that is a new one. Yeah, that's a good one, that. <laughs> yeah, t yeah, do, do. Um, so, the, uh, so who uses Eucalyptus and what for, right? So um, we've got a customer page on the website. Um, actually, this is the second marketing slide, so I made a mistake. So um, customers, uh, what do they typically use Eucalyptus for? Dev test, continuous integration, and reducing cost and spend on, on AWS. We've got folks who are using AWS. They perhaps started using AWS when they, when they build up their companies, like a gaming company, right? 
they're doing like social games, those kind of social media games, those kind of things. They start using AWS for a while and then they realize, oh, actually, it's, it's actually fairly expensive when I'm, I'm, I'm doing all this stuff and my bills are just growing. So, so then they look at something like Eucalyptus as an alternative because they don't really have to do very much in terms of all of that, all of that investment in the tools and how their app interacts with the cloud and the infrastructure. Um, and so they look at us. People like Nokia Siemens Networks down in the, down in the corner there, huge user for, for sort of the continuous integration side of things. Um, sorry, I should say Nokia Solutions and Networks now, um, after, the, after all the, the, the re reorg and whatnot. But um, they're using things like Jenkins uh, with the EC2 plugin and Swarm plugin um, uh, on top of Eucalyptus to provide basically huge build farms, self-service self on demand, um, to, to do all of that, their signaling products and mast um, and relays and all this kind of stuff. Um, so they're a, they're a really big user for us. And then you see App Dynamics down there as well. They're, 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 they're pretty well known alongside Nokia, um, Nokia Solutions and Networks. Uh, and they use it because their solution, their, their product that they, they, uh, they create, their, their application testing framework, that runs on AWS. And so they do a lot of their testing of that on top of Eucalyptus. So uh, in terms of the API uh, and the Amazon-esque constructs and semantics, that's what we currently support. So in its most raw form, you'll find that other cloud platforms um, will support probably EC2, uh, maybe EBS, and maybe S3. Um, some of them are, are, have different feature parity there. Um, but we've, gone for, we've got EC2, which is the compute side of things. So that's instances, right? EBS is the block storage. So that's like providing block storage volumes to VMs, basically. IAM is the identity and access management within, uh, within AWS, and, and we've kind of extended that. Um, and that's for like, you know, authentication. That's like accounts, users, groups, policies, uh, all that kind of stuff. S3 is the object store um, within, uh, we've got an implementation of that, which I'll go into a little bit more detail about later. Security token service, that's a way to get temporary security credentials for a cloud. Um, and that's actually closely tied to something that's not on that, this list, which is called IAM roles. Um, probably people who are more familiar with, with, with AWS will, will, will know that, but I won't go into it. CloudWatch, auto-scaling and elastic load balancing. Uh, we released uh, Eucalyptus 3.3 in June this year. Um, and those were the three core, like, like big services that we delivered. Uh, in Eucalyptus 3.3. So we've got a cloud watch implementation, an auto scaling implementation, and, a, and an ELB implementation. So a little bit more information about Eucalyptus as software. Um, we're GPL v3 licensed. Um, there are a few BSD bits in there as well for things like style sheets for UIs and stuff like that. Um, and we do have two proprietary add ons, and I'll go into those in a little bit more detail. Um, and I'll also look back retrospectively on, on how things used to be. Um, mainly Java and C. So the components which are closer to the VMs, so things like um, node controllers and the cluster controller, which does sort of setting up of networks, uh, it c uh, controls life cycle of VMs and stuff like that. Those are written in C. Uh, and then the web service bits are written in Java. Um, there's also a fair bit of Python in, in some of the tools as well. Um, and we've also got bits of Groovy and Perl in there as well, again, in like tools, uh, basically. Um, we're now a single code base. So um, people might remember from the early days of Eucalyptus, or in fact, not that long ago, really, because we, we didn't change until March 2012. Um, but I think we went down the wrong path of having what many people refer to as an open core model. Um, it wasn't quite open core because in fact the we had two versions basically we had one version which was a community edition and then we had an enterprise edition Oop. oops <laughs> and we had these two different versions and um, <laughs> and um, uh, 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 in fact rather than being one s single code base and then with like different bolt-ons or anything like this um, actually they were two separate code bases for us to maintain uh, which was just a lot of work, full stop. And then we had s feature disparity as well. It was just horrible. Um, and that's, that, that was what people often refer to when they say Eucalyptus was open core or whatever. Now we've just got one single code base as of Eucalyptus 3. 
Um, and then we've just got two like little add-ons, which are like plugins, which are proprietary, that then you, you, you bolt on, basically. Uh, there's five core components, and I'll go into their function in a little bit. Um, basically, the topology of eucalyptus is really, really easy to understand. Um, unlike something like OpenStack, where you have lots and lots of different options for components, we keep things relatively tight. Um, and as such, we've got five core components. We've got the cloud controller, which is basically looks after all of the state of all of res all of the resources in the cloud, um, keeps track of users, handles the authentication, all that kind of side of things. That's basically the brains of the cloud. Then we've got Warus, which is our S3 implementation. Uh, we didn't call it something like I don't know object storage controller or something. We thought we'd call it Warus um, cluster. <laughs> <laughs> cluster controller, and I've, I've got a good picture later, but anyway, cluster controller, that, that handles the networking setup in the cloud. So the cloud has, a, you can have multiple availability zones, and each one will have a cluster controller, and it handles like ingress of networking traffic. It also handles the scheduling, so the placement of VMs within the cluster on nodes. Um, we've got the storage controller. Each availability zone, as well as having a cluster controller, has a storage controller, and that handles EBS, so that handles block storage. Again, I'll go into that in more detail in a moment. Node controller, that's basically your, your hypervisor host. So that's your, that, that's your machine where your VMs are going to run. Um, and, that's, and, and so the, the node controller and that cluster controller, they're the C components um, within the system. So releases, um, just to, to go back a little bit, people might remember uh, 1.6 because uh, that was the version that was most commonly uh, associated with Ubuntu's enterprise cloud. So Ubuntu used to use Eucalyptus, um, and they used to sort of package it up as, as Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud, and that was the version we had in there, 1.6. Um, uh, 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 basically, we, we reached a point where we delivered 2.0 here in August 2010, um, and then we, we set about refactoring um, the code a fair bit to, to basically bake in some new features. One of those features was high availability within the system, so it was, um, instead of relying on like some kind of clustering layer like Pacemaker and CoreSync and something like that, we, uh, we, we baked in like HA at the, the, the actual sort of component layer within Eucalyptus. Um, and so we spent a bit of time writing that and getting to this point where we had 3.0. We spent a bit of time sort of reorganizing the business, moving for, away from that sort of two code base model. Um, and then from then on, we've been releasing software for, well, at a fairly quick pace, sort of between four and six months. Um, but still, uh, I, still I hear that people think we haven't released anything since 2.0, but we are, we're releasing stuff. <laughs> and, and it is coming, maybe we need to do a better job with marketing stuff, but, but you know, we are releasing software and, and we're bringing in fairly big features and, and I'll talk about those a little bit later. 3.4 is coming very soon, is a month away from now. Uh, well, a little bit over a month away from now, um, and we're currently on 3.3.1. So we do uh, we have a major release, and then we typically have one or two maintenance releases within that period, um, following on from that. So we'll have a 3.3. 3 .3. We won't have a 3.3.2 because we're going to release 3.4 fairly quickly, but, but we will do it with other ones. So getting hold of Eucalyptus, uh, we package ourselves. So that, that, what I say, mean by that is Eucalyptus folk actually working at Eucalyptus, package for CentOS, RHEL, Debian, and Fedora. Um, that ties in nicely as to why I'm here. So CentOS is by far and large the, the, um, the most popular distribution to run Eucalyptus on. Um, I think the reason for that is that people are starting to shift the subscription costs and things away from the OS, and they're going up the stack. So instead of paying for like an OS subscription, they'd rather pay for the cloud subscription and do away with that rather than you know, paying extra money and all that. And also, of course, it's just a very stable base um, for something which is fairly important like a cloud platform. We've got other packages in the community who are packaging for uh, specifically Arch, Linux, and Ubuntu. Um, we only provide, at Eucalyptus as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a corporation, we only provide commercial support to customers if they're running on CentOS or RHEL. Um, you can get hold of the Eucalyptus packages from downloads, downloads.eucalyptus.com. Uh, there's various ways to go about installing it. Um, you could use the fast start method where we've basically baked, a, baked an ISO with CentOS 
on there. Um, and it runs the Anaconda installer and asks a few questions, not just about your, your CentOS installation, but about your Eucalyptus configuration as well. And then it'll build you basically a, a cloud in a box for, for, for uh, in about 15 minutes or so. And you can use it to deploy other components as well. So it's fairly sort of, it's, it's fairly, you can scale out to a little, a mini pilot kind of platform. Then there's a Eucalyptus Virtual Cloud, which is relatively new. But if, if, if anyone here was at, uh, at OzCon last, um, we were giving out like USB pens. Um, and they had like a little image, uh, a USB, uh, USB, well, it was a pen with a USB end. And on there is an image for Fedora 19 system using like nested KVM and stuff. So you could build a cloud all on one bootable USB stick. So that's another way you can try it out. Um, and then we also have, uh, we have Ansible playbooks. Um, those, are, they, those are pretty popular, given that Ansible is, is the new hotness right now. Um, we've got, but of course, there are other configuration management systems. It's a, it's a declaim, <laughs> disclaimer here. So, so we do have a Puppet module, which is now up to date as well. So that, that's been kept up to date. And we've worked with the Puppet Labs guys there as well, which is great. Uh, and we've also got some Chef stuff too. So, um, so uh, yeah, so you know, take, take your pick. So from, from an architectural perspective, uh, this is what Eucalyptus looks like. Um, I said it was fairly simple to understand, and you know, that's, this is just sort of a logical diagram, but, but basically what it aims to represent is that we've got three different layers. We've got a cloud layer, a cluster or an availability zone layer, and a node layer. Now the cloud layer, which has the cloud controller um, and the Walrus, which is the S3 implementation on there, those are like the user-facing components. So those are like service endpoints for your users, whoever, whatever. Then with it, below that, we then have this, this cluster level. And you can have um, various number of clusters, different clusters. And within each cluster, it must contain a, a cluster controller and a storage controller. And if you want to use VMware Broker, uh, which basically allows you to use vCenter or ESX hosts as node controllers instead of an open source hypervisor, um, you need to add an additional Java component in there. But you might have these two systems up here, and then you might have, let's say, eight different clusters. And you, so you'd have eight different lots of a cluster controller, storage controller, uh, uh, and so, so forth. And then the lowest level are the nodes, uh, node controllers where the VMs are running. So cloud controller, um, that's, a, that's, that's a Java component running, a, running the web service. And like I said, that's the endpoint for all of the service implementations we make. So EC2, S3, um, not S3, EC2, IAM, auto-scaling, CloudWatch. If you use Amazon, um, you'll be familiar with the whole concept of having to use endpoints for the different services. Um, handles all of that access side of things and can also be made highly available. So our, our HA solution allows you to have basically an, an active and a standby pair. Um, and you, you can pair all of the components apart from the node controllers. Um, with the node controllers, it's a different case. You've got live migration and things like that. Um, and so that HA will give you, give you, like a, give you, you know, a, a brief gap of service time while it fails over to the standby system. Uh, Walrus. So that's, that's, that's actually where it came from. So I think that, that memory is from like 2005. There was like a walrus in some Japanese aquarium and he always carried a bucket around with him. And of course, S3, you've got buckets. Therefore, why don't we call it walrus? <laughs> so, so, you know, starting off as a university research project, I think, you know, they, these are the kind of guys who would, who would do that, you know, name that walrus. And I like to think that if, if we... When we improve on, on our Walrus implementation, we'll maybe call it like Super Walrus or like Mega Walrus or something like that in the future. So that's the S3 object store. So that's like the endpoint for the S3 service. So folks can point like Cloudberry Explorer or Jet S3 or whatever S3 tool they're using and point it at our endpoint uh, and start you know, creating buckets, putting objects in there, putting buckle, bucket ACLs on, that kind of stuff. Again, it can be highly available. The high availability solution is a little bit clunky for Walrus, and so we're actually reworking it right now. At the moment, we have two Walrus systems, and basically, all we, all we require for the storage of objects is a POSIX-compliant file system somewhere, and Walrus uh, actually uses the database that we run. We run Postgres, 
to keep track of objects. So it, it, it's, you know, it, it's a little bit un, un, unwieldy in some regards, but what it means is that um, you, can, you can back the, 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 Warus, the actual storage component of Warus, you could put it onto like a, 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 um, an NFS mount point, something like that, give it a bit of fiber channel, give it a nice SCSI LAN or something, put it onto that. But it, it does have limits for the scalability, right? So, so some folks will run very big machines with a lot of disk trays on them, those kind of things. Um, but the high availability solution actually uses DRBD, and we use DRBD to replicate the, uh, the block device underneath Warus, which isn't really what DRBD was, DRBD was not perhaps designed to act in that kind of way, but it, it, it gets us to that, H, that point of being able to achieve it. Yes, yeah, sorry, you had a question. Um, yes, if you're using it, if you're using S3 enough, if you're using Warus enough and you're, you're shoving enough stuff into there in terms of like writes, yeah, and, and reads, but you know, it, it, it really depends on usage profile. So we've got some folks who aren't running it in an HA configuration to, to do without that. Um, but yeah, we're going to be changing this soon and I'll, I'll cover that a little bit later. Cluster controller, this is the C component that runs on that per availability zone level. So each availability zone full of nodes has a cluster controller. Uh, runs a web service in Apache, which is used by the CLC, the cloud controller, to like tell it to do stuff via the, via the sort of service interface. Um, and it controls that instance placement and, and lifecycle stuff. So the cloud controller will say, launch me an instance. And it'll go off and talk to the cluster controller. The cluster controller will say, oh, you've got a node free here, so put it down there, that kind of stuff. And it also implements the networking features as it stands currently. So it implements security groups basically through IP tables and natting effectively. Um, it can also be made highly available in this active passive kind of configuration, but you can only have one active per cluster. You can't sort of, I don't know, load balance across a couple of cluster controllers or something like that. Um, storage controller, um, that's a Java component and that provides that EBS functionality uh, for, the, for the block storage. So what it'll, effectively do in, it, in its most simplest form will um, get a volume which is made up either of maybe it's a logical volume maybe it's an actual piece of a, an actual block device locally on the system or whatever and it'll export that as an iSCSI target to a node controller which has the instance on and then the instance will basically it'll pass through that, that, that iSCSI target that it's connected to to the instance and then it'll use that as an EBS volume so there's multiple backends you can have here. Um, that was the mo that that explanation I just gave was like the simplest kind of backend we have. Um, not very performant. You wouldn't use it in like a production setting, but it's good for pilots. Um, most of our folks, when I say folks, I mean customers who are using this in sort of a really serious scale. Um, they'll use a they'll use a SAN, so they use like a NetApp filer, um, and we have a we have a SAN adapter, which are these these bolt-ons, these proprietary bolt-ons where if you have a support subscription with us, you get, one, you, you get the SAN adapters, basically. And taking the NetApp one, for example, it just means that the storage controller will talk to the ONTAP API of a NetApp device and say, create me a flex volume, export this flex volume to that node controller. And so the storage controller becomes basically an arbitrator of do this for, for, for this volume operation, do this, do that, you know, delete that volume, create that volume, snapshot it, that kind of stuff. Um, the SC will also cache snapshots as well within the availability zone, so it provides a more localized um, copy of a, of, of a snapshot. Uh, and this can also be highly available, but only when using a SAN at the moment. And you can only have one active per cluster. Uh, node controller, um, so this is where the VMs run. Uh, this is another C component with, uh, with a web service running in Apache that the CC uses to talk to, talk to the node. Um, we use libvert, so we talk to libvert, and in theory, we should be able to use both KVM and Zen. Um, Zen, we don't officially support, and we, we, we kind of dropped support for that out of demand from users just wanting to use KVM. And this was prior to Zen coming into the, coming, well, coming into the kernel, right, with Zen 4 or whatever it was. Um, and so, yeah, we use libvert, so in theory, we can, we can get Zen going again when, we, when we've got the demand for it. Um, we use local, yeah, go for it. 
Um, so, so, so basically, when a node controller constructs uh, an instance, it will, uh, it will sort of specify all the devices with the instance, for example. And you could, you could absolutely just change a template. What we do is we template it. So you can change a template to say, give me a spice adapter. And then, yeah, fine. You can use that, absolutely. Um, so yeah, we use local storage for ephemeral. We don't use any shared storage at the node controller layer. Ephemeral storage is, um, who's, a fi who's familiar with the term of ephemeral in terms of cloud, cloud instances? Okay, some of you. So, so ephemeral is basically like, wh when you have a machine image and you go and launch that somewhere in the cloud on a node controller, it'll take the image and it'll, it'll expand it and start up a VM from it. The storage within that image is termed as ephemeral because if that image dies, you lose any data in that, 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 that construct. It, it, it just goes. And so the ephemeral space is, is, is on local storage, and we, we, we do that for a reason, and, and the primary reason is just performance. Um, folks who are wanting to, wanting to get pretty fast disk performance for particular reasons um, will use the ephemeral um, more than they will the, the elastic block store, which is this kind of network attached storage. Um, and they'll, but they'll use that network attached storage for the persistence over the performance. So it gives options. And, and in terms of live migration, we use like a block migration in, in um, uh, KVM, QMU. So um, that, that, I know that's being currently sort of reworked as it stands. It's, there's a lot of work going on on that. But yeah, we use that at the moment to actually migrate machines. Um, the, end, the node controller handles that instantiation of VMs, so start a VM, terminate a VM, stop a VM, blah, blah, uh, attach a volume, and also bundling tasks is one to note as well. So within AWS, what you can do is you can have a, have a machine running, and then you can do what's called a, a, a bundle instance, which basically takes the instance as it is and creates a new image from it. So you can effectively do like a point in time kind of snapshot of the image, and then you can use it for like other stuff, or you can keep it as a as a reference. So we, we support those 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 constructs uh, as well. So this is kind of what like a, a reference deployment of Eucalyptus looks like. You've got your you've got your user facing components up here, and there's one that I didn't mention, which is the user console. We've got like a user UI that you can either you can actually point it at Amazon, or you can point it at Eucalyptus, and you can you know, just, just use it to like start a VM and tag stuff and handle resources from a user's perspective. But here you've got these kind of clusters, which are kind of compartmentalized with their own little private networks. Um, and typically, people will use like a, a, a rack or a number of racks to like achieve that kind of cluster and to keep them kind of segregated like that. And you'll end up with, with, a, with, a, with a configuration a little bit, little bit like that. So um, I want to do is I'm just going to go into a demo in a moment just to show what some of the features look like and that they actually work and everything. And um, the, uh, the, this, this talks a little bit about what we brought in in 3.3. So as well as those three new services, CloudWatch, Auto Scaling, and Elastic Load Balancing, we also delivered uh, improvements uh, with tagging, filtering, uh, which is like basically filtering a view based on tags and other, and other values. Uh, more instance types so that we're in line with Amazon in terms of the instance or machine types. Um, live migrations. Um, and to go back to that, we can do that between clusters. So if you have uh, availability zones, you can like move your instances out of an availability zone into another one so that you could then take an availability zone down for maintenance or something like that. And improvements with the SDK. So, so that one's really important for us because um, those kind of SDKs are what developers are using to develop you know, against AWS. Um, and they can now use those same SDKs to develop against Eucalyptus as well. So folks who are, who are, who are big Java, um, Java developers against AWS, they can use the Java SDK, the .NET SDK. If you're a Python guy, you can use Python Boto. That's always worked very, very well because the guy who wrote it used to work for us. Uh, he now works AWS. Um, um, there's a fog, I think, is, is we're, we're working on that at the moment, improving that too. But yeah, there's all sorts of SDKs you can use uh, against Yuka. So, so let, me, let me just switch over to um, a system that I've got, and I'll just log into the user console here. So 
This is basically our, our user console that came in 3.2, um, which was, um, uh, uh, well, asked for by a lot of people, basically. They wanted a, they wanted a UI which we kind of had the, the, the control over the roadmap, and they wanted a UI that they could um, use against Eucalyptus, but also point to AWS and achieve some kind of like hybrid kind of scenario where, and, and that's really where we're heading. We don't have that right now, but, but what we want to be doing is we want to have almost a single pane of glass where you've got both AWS and Eucalyptus resources and you can, you can manipulate them both. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then there's all sorts of other things that come with that, you know, because you've got to think about the credentials and federation of like, uh, you know, the accounts and users and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that, that's definitely the route we're taking. So, but this is, a, this is the user console. I'll just go ahead and log in here. Here we go. It's just over the wireless here, so it might be a little bit slow. But we'll just have a look around, and you can, and those who are familiar with AWS will be able to see kind of the similarities um, and also get a feel for kind of what we can do uh, in terms of the, the, the different actions we can take. So this is the main dashboard. Um, I've actually got a couple of, what I've got is I've got a couple of machines which are in a scaling group. For those who aren't familiar with auto scaling, auto scaling is a way to, when combined with some kind of monitoring or metric system, is a way to increase or decrease the number of instances or the number of VMs you have based on events. So you might have an event like uh, the network traffic has gone through the roof. I need to add more instances to, to serve my site or something like that. And so it would be able to automatically respond to that. So I, I'll go through and sh show you in a, in a moment uh, how that works in Eucalyptus. But this is the main dashboard. I can take a look at the kind of images that are, that are in the cloud. Um, it's going to be a little bit slow because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm over the wireless here. But we can see the images that we've got up here. This image here is the one that I'm actually using for the, for the demo. Um, and that's an image which is being bootstrapped by Ansible as well. So when it comes up, it's using Ansible pull to pull down a configuration from a Git repo and just do a few things. So basically, like, just install a few packages, that kind of stuff. Because when you're using auto-scaling, the challenge you're going to face is that if you've got to respond quickly to an event, like, you know, my, my existing systems are getting nailed, how quickly can I get my part of my application up to help reduce the load and serve clients or whatever? And as part of that, you either bake all your software into your image, and you have to continually keep that up to date, which is fine, or you'd use a configuration management system like Puppet or Chef or Ansible or Salt or whatever, um, so that when it comes up, it's immediately configured and then is ready to go. And so that's what I've done with, with that image there. But we can go ahead and we can launch an instance and it'll take us through the, through the wizard that we use. Um, we can tag the instance, we can select the security groups, select the key pairs, we can import SSH keys, you know, if you've got one and you don't want to be managing like 500 different keys, those kind of things. So we select the number of instances we want, we select the instance size we want. I, I haven't tweaked these, but we, there's various different sizes we can choose. Uh, we can select the availability zone, so if you have different clusters, you could choose which cluster you want to place it into. By default, if you choose no cluster, it, it does an automatic kind of, you know, which is the best cluster for, for me to end up in. Then you can do your tags, so you can have like, a, and this is my app, and it's um, dummy app or something like that. You can add that, add that tag in. In the security section, you can add in a key pair, so I'd add my, my SSH key pair there. Uh, choose which security group. I've only got one, but it's got these rules attached to it. And then, um, like we saw earlier as well in the, in, in the, uh, in the cloud stack demo as well, um, the concept of user data, um, that's a way to basically pass um, some accessible metadata to an instance when it's launched where the instance can use that to do some like post configuration of some kind. So you could even pass like a, you know, install puppet agent as a command like yum install puppet and then if your image is configured correctly, it would just pull that down as a script and run it, and then you'd have a puppet agent, you know, maybe a config in there, something like that. So you can do those kind of things. And you can also attach it as a file, so you could just attach like a script in there as well. Uh, and then we can just launch it, and then it'll go off and, and, and start running. So I've got two instant, these two instances currently running, right, in this scaling group. Now, 
Um, what we haven't done in the UI yet in 3.3 is implement um, load balancing uh, in the UI, i.e. so you can actually manipulate load balancers and CloudWatch properly. So I'm actually going to switch to a different UI. Um, this UI is called Yuka Lobo, uh, which is, a, um, which is a, a fork of a tool called Elastic Wolf. Um, AWS used to provide this as a UI for GovCloud, US GovCloud, um, and it was only recently that support for GovCloud was added to the AWS like web console, and so they used to use this. And this is quite good because it's got like all the different features that I want. So I've actually got a load balancer here, which is which is sat and has been running for a while. It's got a couple of instances registered to it, and they're marked as in service. If, we, if I double click the actual load balancer is it itself, it shows us all the properties. And you can configure listeners and a health check. So for an instance to be marked like in service, you'd configure these health checks to effectively kind of ping um, what a, something about the instance. And in this case, it's you know, HTTP port 80, and it's looking for an index.html. And if it gets something, it goes, oh, that's fine, that's in service. That's a healthy instance. Um, says the zone I've got there, um, security group that the load balancer is running in, all these different things. But if I take the DNS name, so if I do a, uh, if I just do a copy DNS name uh, and put that into a new tab, that should then resolve and give me a test page. So I've got I've got it load balanced across a couple of instances right now, and it's nothing terribly fancy, but really just to demonstrate that. It's there and it's running. And if I now scale my instances for some reason, what I want to happen is I want those instances to then be added to the load balancer as well. So if I just break out and go back to my shell here, I'm just going to run some. I'm just going to run some stress on the two instances that I have in the scaling group to start generating CPU load. Now if I go back to uh, CloudWatch, which is this metric implementation, which allows you to specify what do you look out for and then what action do I take when that has happened or that threshold's crossed. I've got two alarms in here. Now, one, you see that one of them's alarming, but I'll go into that. Yeah, one of them's, one of them's alarming, but, um, <laughs> but, but basically, um, you'll see why that is in a moment. But you can see all these different elements of the alarm. So, it's actually looking at a percentage value, a threshold of 60% of the CPU utilization metric, and it's saying when it's greater than or equal to the threshold, I'm going to take this action down here. And that action links to a scaling policy that I have here, which performs a scale up. So within AWS and Eucalyptus you have the concept and, and other cloud providers you have the concept of what are basically scaling groups and these are the groups of, of how many instances do I want what's the minimum number what would I how many would I uh, like to have at most if there's scaling stuff going on and and here that applies to this group so I say I'm gonna go plus one instance when I scale it's gonna be a change in capacity and it's gonna be off that alarm that I just showed you so if I now go back to the alarm, take a look at it here, and then show the graph for it, and if I draw it out first, let's draw it out for a day, and just wait for that to load. Okay, so we've got a load of metrics here. So these, me these metrics are collected basically on one minute intervals. The node controllers in the cloud collect metrics on an instance, and then they then batch send after a minute those back to the cloud controller, and it stores them in the database and then it's referred to them via our implementation of the web services. So, so here there's been some spikes of CPU here and here yesterday when I was just making sure it worked. And here as well when I came in this morning and was super nervous and thought I better check it again. And then um, what we'll start to see is you can he see here we've got a new data point appear. The CPU usage is starting to climb again. Now, CloudWatch, again, if you're familiar with AWS, CloudWatch isn't a monitoring service. It's a metric service. There's a difference. So it's not like real time. It's because you're, you, you can specify the kind of period at which you bring in updates. So it's not real time. So it's, that's important to just, just make a note of. But 
we should see in a moment that we'll get another data point. So at the moment, it's you know the last data point was up there like what almost 14 percent or something. So it'll st continue to climb. And then when we reach, let me close that for the moment. When we reach a certain point, we'll see here that this CPU threshold will then go into an alarm state. Um, and that'll say, whoop, whoop, something's happening. I've detected that on this, you know, these statistics, it's, it's gone over whatever, I need to take an action. And then you can configure it so that after a certain number of checks over a set period, so has it been like that for five minutes? As it, if it has, then I'm gonna do something about it. And then it'll start to scale the number of instances. So in a moment, we should, appear, we should see one Start, well, that's the one I, I launched earlier, but we should see one in a minute start to, uh, start to take action. And we can actually look at the, the scaling activities when this page loads, because there's quite a lot of them, that, that have taken place. So you can track, you can kind of audit what's been going on and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. So you can see here that the last one was this morning when it actually scaled back down. Um, but in a minute, yeah, it'll, it'll scale up. So that, that's, that's, um, that's that side of things, and I'll go back to it in a moment. But um, within the UI, this UI here, we've got users, uh, roles, so we can specify IAM roles for instances, all this kind of stuff. Um, but it's a fairly good, fairly good UI for, like, uh, for just testing functionality, really. Uh, and that's why I thought I'd show it. Um, but I'll come back to that in a minute, and I'll carry on with the presentation, because I think I'm running over time. Um, so let me talk about the future features, and then we'll go back to that. Oh trying to connect. Okay, well, I'll carry on anyway. So 3.4, which is coming out in October, um, we're delivering a number of new features with Eucalyptus. Um, one of those is what we call edge networking. Um, so at the moment, our cluster controller kind of sits in the network path of all of the instances as this gatekeeper in an availability zone, um, which is just sort of suboptimal, really. Um, and so we're, we're moving to a mode where that's, that's gone, basically. And it allows us then to implement in 4.0 onwards a lot of VPC-like features too. Um, this hybrid UI as well. So in 3.4, in a month's time, we'll have a, we'll have a UI that you can at least, from a wizard kind of in a nice user experience perspective, point at different clouds. Um, warm upgrades is one. So when you've been upgrading Eucalyptus versions, we always state that you need to stop instances in the cloud, terminate them. And we do that because if you think about it, if you're upgrading the, the brains of the cloud, like the cloud controller, which tracks state across the cloud, if you take that down uh, for an upgrade, and in the meantime, someone, a user has gone, oh, I'm going to terminate my instance or something like that, and they've done it from within the instance, you suddenly have that coming back up thinking, oh, well, my state information is wrong and all this kind of stuff. So you have to cater for that. And so we've, we've been working on that so that we can get around those kind of scenarios with a warm upgrade, which means there's just like five minutes of service downtime while you just upgrade the components. Just yum, update, done. There's nothing complicated about it from a user and an admin perspective. IEM roles, which is a security feature which is very useful for developers particularly, uh, allows them to avoid keeping their credentials in instances, which is like a very, um, something that people are, well, when I say people, AWS security experts and, and cloud security experts would say, don't keep your cloud credentials inside your instance. Because if someone gets into your instance, they'll just go and terminate all your machines or whatever. So IAM roles gets around that because it applies a role to the instance, and if the instance is trying to talk to an endpoint, it basically knows that, that there's, a, there's a security profile with it, but it doesn't in a, in a particular way. Um, image management, so we're going to be able to import Amazon machine images directly uh, into Eucalyptus. Um, VMDK, so VMware machine images, we can actually do that already, but it's a bit clunky, so we're going to improve it. Uh, and sanity checks on images using libguestfs. So uh, if you're familiar with libguestfs, it's just a useful way to kind of open up guest file systems, basically, and take a peek and do stuff. Um, so we're going to use that to be able to do like sanity checks on images before they go into the cloud or something. Because often the feedback we get from users is that the hardest thing, in a way, is just getting an image that has all your stuff and works as you want it to into the cloud. 
Uh, and then this bit is quite interesting, this modular scalable walrus. This is like that mega walrus. And um, this is going to be a tech preview, but, but basically what we're doing is we are uh, creating a S3 storage gateway. So we're basically having like a proxy for requests. And then we're going to have pluggable backends. And we're starting with React CS. Um, we looked at React CS and Swift, and we decided with React CS. Oh, we also looked at Ceph Rados, um, which is the object, object store uh, implementation of that. And um, yeah, we settled on React CS. Uh, we're working fairly closely with the Basho guys to, to get that done. Um, and that'll basically just mean we have a much more scalable architecture with the object storage side of things. Uh, to go down as well, 4.0. Um, so we're going to actually commercially support the uh, mega walrus and the, the edge networking side of things. So i.e., you know, paying customers will get you know, support for it. In 3.4, there'll be a preview feature. Uh, we'll have this improved unified UI. So at the moment, and let me actually load that up because you can see how kind of clunky that is because I'm not going to hide it from you. It's not... It's not brilliant, but, oh. oh. OK, I won't show it to you just now. Yeah, I, d I didn't test that. So, the, um, so there's, there's, uh, there, there's basically a very old UI that we've got. It's about two years old now. And it's basically only used for managing accounts, users, and groups. Um, it's supposed to be an admin UI, but it's far from it. Um, we're going to improve that. We're going to lump that in with the user console that we've seen here. Uh, so that if you log in as a cloud administrator, you've got additional options and stuff available to you. And this is, you know, this is where we're putting all the UI effort. The old UI, we're just not, you know, we're not really putting any effort into it other than bug fixes and stuff. Cloud formation. Uh, if you're familiar with cloud formations in AWS, it's a way to template a stack of resources. So you can template like instances, load balancers, scaling groups, you know, any resource in AWS. We want to be implementing that. Uh, then there's VPC-like features so that we can have like just little VPC subnets and stuff, uh, and we'll do that. Uh, reserved instances, it's a way to reserve capacity in the cloud. Um, so users can reserve a big chunk of cores or something, um, and they know that they'll always be able, to be able to use that. Tied to that will be kind of a way whereby we implement a spot instance type feature where that reserve capacity, when it's not being used, someone else can use it with a spot instance, which basically is an instance which could be terminated at any time, but they could use it to use up that compute resource. And placement groups, which is a way to, and, and a, a good example is, let's say you've got a MongoDB replica set, and you launch five instances in this replica set, and you put them in the cloud, but they all happen to end up on actually the same node controller which is absolutely no good whatsoever, because if that node controller dies, you know, that, that's it. You know. so, so the placement groups will get around that in being able to, um, as a cloud administrator, control where users put their stuff as well to say, you know, what are you, you, know, what are you doing there? Just move that across, you nutter. And then um, also be able to, from a user perspective, just make sure their stuff's not all bunched together. So, right, well, that's pretty much it for me, but let me go back. Well, we can see we've got another instance running already, right? Um, and if we go back to the uh, back to the scaling activity, we can take a look here, and we should see uh, when it's loaded um, another success line here, successful launching new instance. Um, and so that's as a, as a response to that alarm, right? And if we go back to the alarms now, we'll see that there'll still be a warning um, based on the kind of CPU that we've got. And if I just narrow this down to one minute periods. 30 minutes and load that and wait for it to load. We can see here that the CPU is, is still kind of, it's, it's jumping up and down above that threshold as an average across all those machines. So if there's two data points in my alarm that go over 60%, then it will scale something. If there's only one data point, no, it won't do anything. So that's why it's alarming and saying, look, you know, you, something still happened here, but I'm not going to do anything about it yet because you've said, you know, wait for two data points. So, that's just an example of the auto-scaling working there. Um, auto-scaling is also quite a useful way for users to maintain a fleet of like build bot machines, basically, as well. So we've got, like, some, we've got some users like Nokia Siemens who are, um, would be uh, looking to use this with uh, Swarm plugin. 
so that they can always maintain a constant number of systems to build with but if something happens to them, like a couple of them die or something because a node controller, someone trips up over the power cord or more trips into it because it's in a rack, so they'd have to... So they, and then, <laughs> so they unplug it and they lose a couple, you know, we'll bring a couple more back. So, so yeah, but it's, a, it's, it's certainly a cool feature. Um, yeah, uh, ways to try it. Those are the links. I'll put this up. I'll share it somewhere later. Um, playbooks and other stuff like that as well if you want to install it that way. Um, and install from packages. But, but yeah, that, that's it for me. Have we got any questions? I know I'm a bit over time, I think. But yeah, go for it. The, the metrics you just showed, can you um, get it somewhere else? Can you send it to Graphite or anything else? Uh, you, can, you can dump out the stats. So let me see. Um, might be a little bit slow. So you can dump out the stats using any CLI like, like utility like the EC2 or the CloudWatch API tools or Yuka tools. So that's another thing I failed to mention was that we have a, we have a, command, a Python command line suite called Yuka tools, which people have probably used against like CloudStack, OpenStack, whatever as well. Um, but you can use that to, to basically get all those stats dumped out in format. And then you could then you know, fire it into something else. Um, yeah. So, is, does that answer your question? Kind of. Yeah. So you can you can do it. Yeah. And you or you could just use you could write your own way to query the API via the developer developer docs and grab them that way. So. Yeah. Uh, another metrics question. What sort of metrics do you have around storage? Yeah. Yep. Here we go. One moment. Oh, I'm not collecting any at the moment, I don't think. No. Um, so we have, uh, we have here, we've got disk read in bytes, disk read in ops, write bytes, write ops, uh, and that's basically it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, again, if you've got the most storage traffic or something, you could do something with them or whatever, you do a scaling operation or something, or send a... Another thing we're looking at implementing are, like, notification services, like SNS and stuff and those kind of things, and then you could send notifications to, like, a storage admin saying these guys are causing trouble or something. Um, but, yeah, you can absolutely do that. And, and also in the reporting side of Eucalyptus, you can get that information as to what users are using. So if users are using a lot of storage I.O., you can, you can capture that and then bill them. Yeah. There's no billing engine in Eucalyptus at the moment. You'd have to do it yourself. So you'd have to, like, go hire an Excel contractor for a few days and get him to, like, a whiz you up a nice spreadsheet or something. But... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. And, and, yeah. But yeah, that reporting information, because the metric information is separate, right? The reporting information is, is on a per user and account basis, but the metric is just kind of on a per, it, it's got these kind of dimensions and resources it's attached to and stuff. So there's different ways you can do it, yeah. Um, well, you oh, what you've got a developer you want to plug it. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, we don't have a we don't have a marketplace, no. But um, I mean, if you're interested in from a development perspective, you know, GitHub, Eucalyptus IRC, ping one of the engineers or whatever, something like that. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Have you got any plans to um, come up with an RDS equivalent? Um, yes, we have actually. Um, 4.0 or 4.1. So, so this this stuff back here in 4.0, I did have a. I should have, I should have mentioned it, but I've got a little disclaimer here. Look, but um, but 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 RDS is also in the list for scoping. So it depends what users want first. And if it's RDS, it'll probably be something Postgres based. Um, something like that. So yeah, absolutely. Um, and also an Elastic Map Reduce as well. That's something else that people have asked for. Um, so, yeah, maybe. We've got people, you know, 
people can run Hadoop on whatever and they're already doing it, but to have that service interface, that people are definitely asking for it. So, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Um, yes. Uh, again, that's in the scoping, but that's per post 4.0. So I think that's, that's probably going to be, if we're going to implement that, it will be middle to the end of next year. But yeah, uh, SNS and SQS, the thing is those services are also dependencies for other services. So if we go and develop like, uh, I don't know, maybe RDS even has it as a dependency, then we have to like, we have to implement them as well kind of thing. So it might come earlier, I mean, don't know. But yeah, we absolutely do, definitely, definitely. Yeah, go for it. Uh, you mentioned Ubuntu uh, bundle that's at one point. Yeah. They don't do that. No, so, so Ubuntu had Ubuntu Enterprise, uh, they had this Ubuntu Enterprise cloud which was like bundled eucalyptus, but then they went down the OpenStack route. So at the Ubuntu Summit they went, we'll go for OpenStack and we'll do something with OpenStack. I, I don't know how their bundle works as it stands, but, but yeah, that's basically where it went. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We know that when you scale out and have more servers, Amazon web services are very expensive and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Do you have any case studies where customers have migrated back to? Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, we absolutely do. On the on the um, on the website here, we've we uh, on our website. I mean, this is me zoomed out, but but on here we've got some customers who who have got explicit case studies saying we came back to Yuka because it was too expensive at AWS, or we're doing more Yuka, or we went for Yuka from something else. So so yeah, absolutely, and 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 that's actually quite a common one because that's that that's. Particularly with the smaller companies like MemSQL there, for example, they went to AWS because it's easy to start with. And it's like, oh, the, you know, I can just click and click and I've got a few machines and stuff. But then when they start using it over time and actually really hammering it and then storing a lot of inf data in there, it gets quite expensive. And so they've, they've come, to come to use Eucalyptus now to, to help reduce the costs. So, yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks very much for your time.